Hey everyone, I am really excited to share today's video on the Cornell note taking system. I know there are several videos and websites out there that you can find on the Cornell notes, but when I was researching on how to use these notes myself, um, I found that a lot of the information was how to use them for what I like to call like fact based knowledge, and I was needing to use them for a, more of a critical thinking type study method and uh, so I kind of just took all that information and spent this past summer when I was taking my pharmacology course on trying different ways trying different things kind of adapting the Cornell note system to uh, one that could work better for a nursing school student um, for those of you that are familiar with Cornell Notes, you will see that the main concepts, the basic structure and function of the Cornell Notes is still in place. And for those of you who are new to the Cornell Notes system, I'm going to go over all of those basic things. But for everybody, I hope that you will uh, see how it can be adapted to more higher level uh, thinking courses. Um, courses where you really have to use um, application of knowledge and not just recall the information. Um, so I hope that this encourages you to try the system out. Um, be sure to subscribe to my channel and don't forget to like this video. So what is so great about Cornell Notes? It is a proven organizational method. Um, the Cornell Notes system began at Cornell University back in the 1950s and has been advocated and used by many higher educational institutions since then. Uh, there have also been plenty of studies that show that Cornell Notes um, are very useful in classes where students are required to apply the learned knowledge, just not learn the knowledge but actually apply it. It is a study system. Um, Cornell notes are not a loan device. They are a part of a whole system that we will go through um, in the course of this video. It encourages active learning. Nursing classes you know, are not like other college level classes. Um, you have to actively learn. This means you have to spend a lot of time outside of the class researching concepts, applying concepts. Um, it's just not given to you all in the classroom. It uh, increases comprehension of all these concepts. You know, in nursing, we simply can't just memorize a set of facts and hope to become successful. We have to use prior knowledge to build upon new concepts. We have to apply this knowledge to each individual client that we take care of. You know, there is not a set of facts that are universal to every client or scenario we encounter. So we have to be able to comprehend a concept. Um, it encourages critical thinking um, and it increases your critical thinking abilities. You know, this kind of goes along with comprehension. You know, nursing is not black and white. It is very gray. So we have to know the concept and we have to know how to critically think through this concept and apply it to a, a specific client or a specific scenario. And it can improve your test scores. Um, not just writing the notes will improve your test scores. You know, it is a whole system. It does require a lot of active learning and a lot of application and a lot of uh, effort and energy. But if you put in that effort and really stick to the system, you will see an improvement on your test scores. So let's start with the basics. Uh, Cornell notes are set up in a specific way. As you can see here, um, this is a template that I use for my notes. I created this using Excel, but you can easily use just a sheet of notebook paper. Um, also, there are templates available for download you can find online. Uh, if you'd like my template and want to use it, I will post a link in the comment section below um, to my Dropbox. Uh, you don't have to sign up for Dropbox to download it. I mean, it's going to ask you to sign in, but you can just exit it out and you will still have availability to download it but it is an Excel document so you will need to have access to Microsoft Excel in order to open it up view it and print it for yourself so the basic structure of Cornell notes um, there are four distinct sections we have the header which is up at the top 
the notes are in the larger column over on the right hand side of the page. Our critical thinking column is uh, the smaller column over on the left hand side of the page and we have a summary section that is down at the bottom. So uh, we're going to start with the header. The header is where you identify what content is included on the page. So we have the main topic and the main topic is basically the main concept of the set of notes. Now what I mean is that this is the concept for the chapter or the lecture you're covering. Uh, usually your main topic is going to be consistent for several pages of notes. Uh, my lectures are broken down by concept and each test is going to cover you know, usually three to five main concepts. For example, your lecture's main concept may be vital signs, or it may be fluid and electrolytes, or cardiovascular drugs. And then we have the subtopic. The subtopic is a smaller concept of our main topic. Uh, this is a specific topic covered on just this one page of notes. Now, yes, there are some subtopics that are a little bit more in-depth and will require you to have multiple pages, and that's okay. But uh, say, for our example, um, our main topic is vital signs, that our subtopic is going to be temperature. And that's just going, I'm only going to talk about temperature on this page. Um, or our, sub, our main topic might be cardiovascular drugs, and our subtopic is just going to be drugs affecting blood pressure. So we're going to try to keep one subtopic per page. Um, you might want to include your source. I've love to include the source in all my notes. Um, you know, as nursing students, we don't just have a textbook. We have like 80 textbooks and an ATI book and ATI content online. We have a plethora of <laughs> sources that we have to use every day to study. So I like to notate up at the top in my header where the information from this set of notes is coming from, um, whether it's coming from a textbook or coming from the lecture. Just in case I have any questions, I know where I can go back to review. I also include the exam number in my header. Um, again, this is just to keep me organized and keep me knowing where I'm at. Uh, many times I am writing notes for exam two, and we haven't even had exam one yet. So it kind of keeps my notes in perspective and keeps me organized. And I always put my name on my pages. Um, just one of those things, you know, if the page falls out of my notebook, hopefully one of my fellow classmates would pick it up and see my name on it and hand it back to me. That way I don't have to go back and rewrite another page of notes. And it's very important to put the page number on these. Um, I don't know how many times I have been working on notes and accidentally dropped them to the floor and have you know 40 pages of notes laying on the floor that I now got to put back in order so having the page number on there makes that much more efficient and these are just two examples showing the header section filled out it's kind of self-explanatory um, and I color code if you don't color code that's fine but you will see throughout this video that I like to use color to help things stand out and help me keep things organized we're going to go on to the notes section. Um, this is the bulk of the page. This is also where we will spend a lot of our time in the system. You know, this is where we're going to put all those little knowledge nuggets that we are getting from the book or getting from the instructor. Now, I highly recommend creating notes prior to class. Not only will you have a working document to use during lecture, but it also gets you familiar with the information your instructor is going to be covering. And if you're already a little bit familiar with the information, you're more likely to grasp those concepts that you're going to be going over in class. But you need to determine how best to create notes for your specific class. Now, don't be afraid to be flexible. Um, my nursing program, um, all the classes are team taught, which means we could have three to five instructors per class and each instructor covers you know certain main concepts so I could have a different instructor every time I go to class and each instructor has their own ways of lecturing and teaching um, so you might have to make some changes for every class that you go to for every instructor 
And then that's okay. You know, take a little time at the beginning of the semester, figure out what works for, you know, one instructor, what doesn't work for another structure, you know, just this is just getting a broad basic concept and then you can adapt them as necessary for each class. Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, you know, your instructor may provide notes for their lecture ahead of class. And this is great. It is a great way to know what that instructor kind of deems important and how they're going to structure their lecture. But don't let those notes become a crutch. Um, if my instructor provides notes prior to class, I rewrite those notes into my Cornell template. Um, going back to what I said earlier about having notes prior to class, you know, simply putting them or printing them out does not count for creating notes before class. Rewriting or retyping them forces you to read them before the class. It, um, it also forces you to take their notes and reorganize them into a way that suits your needs. Um, I've had some instructors where their notes is just literally a wall of text. I mean, just sentence after sentence after sentence. And I've had to go in and try to figure out what are my main topics, what are my subtopics, where, how do I organize this information into a bulleted list that makes sense to me. Um, this engages your brain. This helps you, you know, comprehend the material a little bit better. It kind of gets you, gets the ball rolling for you. So don't let them become a, don't let them become a crutch for you. Uh, create notes from the required reading. You know, you may have to do this if your instructor does not provide notes for you before class. Um, but even if they do, read the chapter. You know, you can still read the chapter. If you or somebody likes to highlight in your book, you can still do that. You know, then just take those highlighted sections and kind of summarize them and write them into your Cornell template. Again, you know, this requires you to actively organize the material. It requires you to read the material and become a little bit familiar with it before a lecture. Um, this is how you engage your brain. This is how you start that ball rolling to getting to thinking about these concepts. And do not omit notes from reading that you're reading your textbook. Um, your instructors are instructors. They are not teachers. They are not always going to give you all the information you need to know. They may test you over everything that's in that book, but might not necessarily talk about it in class. Um, so you can use the instructor's notes, write them out, then read your chapter and add into those notes anything extra that you think could possibly be tested over or you believe is important. But do not omit anything from reading. You always need to read. So when writing typing your notes, you know, there are some tips that I have uh, just to make it a bit more efficient, you know, and this is regardless of whether your notes are from the instructor or whether your notes are from, you know, you reading the textbook. You want to leave lines between each bit of information. Um, you want to have room to add in information from another source or to clarify anything or to even just add in an example that helps illustrate that point. You want to use abbreviations. The medical world has hundreds of abbreviations that we use every day, so use them in your notes as well. Um, go over being common words like the word with and the word without have medical abbreviations. Um, some disease processes have medical abbreviations. Um, so just don't forget to use those. It makes it a lot easier, a little bit more efficient. And don't forget abbreviations, you know, for common words like the word and or the word example. Um, and create your own if necessary. Uh, during pharmacology, you know, drugs have side effects. So instead of writing out the word side effects over and over and over again, I just abbreviate it to a capital S and a capital E. Um, just make sure that if you use your own examples, or sorry, your own abbreviations, they make sense to you and you know what they are. Um, so you're not trying to figure out uh, what it is you were trying to say. Do not try to make complete sentences. Now, this one I find it the hardest to do. Um, 
but do know that the word the can be eliminated a lot when writing notes. Um, yes, your notes will sound a little funny because the sentence is not grammatically correct, but omit those unimportant words. It can save you a lot of time. Um, just get the main concepts on the page. Don't write out numbers. Again, it's about saving time. It is simpler to just write out the number eight than to spell it out. And I know a lot of us love to use colored pens, and I am no exception, and you will see that as we continue on with this video. But I recommend actually writing your notes in one color, and I recommend that that color be in black. Um, you'll see why, because we're going to use the color to actually highlight things we want to stand off the page. So we want to make sure all of our words are in one color. Just one color, and then we'll use another color, or two or three, to make things stand out from the page. And I've already stated this, but you know we want to keep our subtopics grouped together. Um, even if your subtopic only requires like a half a page of your template, resist the urge to start a new subtopic on that page. So going back to our example, if you know our subtop or our main topic is vital signs and our subtopic is temperature, and I only have notes for half the page, don't start a new subtopic on that page. Don't make that page be about temperature and pain. You just want to keep it to be just temperature. Um, and this will help us when we're doing our critical thinking questions and our summary later. It'll make them make it easier for you to study the material. So here is an example of uh, the notes section filled out. This is what I would bring to class. Um, I know this is not all the information on the subject, but for example purposes, I just wanted to keep it simple. Uh, you'll notice that my drug class and the generic drug name um, are in color, and this is a personal choice of mine, uh, just so that they stood out from the page. Again, color coding is not necessary. Uh, again, you know, I just tailored this to my to my personal preference. And you'll also notice that I use a bulleted list for my note taking. You can use any format that you like. If you want to use outline or concept mapping or however it is you like to actually write notes, use it here. You know, personal preference. Um, th these notes were actually what was given to us by the instructor prior to class. I know the source says it came from the textbook. I just didn't change it um, when creating the, the picture here. But when I looked at her notes, I noticed that they were just kind of very brief bullet points, just brief to the point information. So I had a feeling that when we got to lecture, she was going to elaborate on this information and give us more details to go off of. So I left plenty of spaces um, around each concept or each little information nugget there um, to give me room to add in anything else she might say in class. Now, in class, um, may vary from instructor to instructor as, you know, you might have instructors that it's just better to sit there and listen and participate in the class instead of taking notes. And you may have others where it's just you're, you're fine writing notes or writing extra information uh, in class. Um, if you're going to be taking further notes in class, you're going to be fleshing out your notes at this point. And this means you're going to be adding in that extra information from the instructor uh, you may be drawing diagrams, pictures, you know, adding in some mnemonics provided. Uh, you might be jotting down example NCLEX style questions that the instructor asks you. Uh, you're going to highlight key information that um, the instructor kind of points out you might need to know. Um, so here I want you to really think about listening to cues from your instructors. I mean, they might blatantly say you need to know this bit of information. Um, Usually, if they mention a concept or mention a fact multiple times, it's pretty important. So you need to highlight that <laughs> as something you definitely need to know. Um, I use post-its uh, when I'm taking notes in class. I use them to make a quick note about you know, any tables in the chapter they specifically want us to know. Or um, I use them to leave myself a note that I need to spend more time on um, a certain topic after class. Um, I might make a little note that, you know, uh, hey, we weren't able to capture, you know, write down everything she said here. 
might want to go back and listen to the recorded lecture and uh, get this information again. So it just kind of, they're a little like little flags of things I don't want to permanently put in my note, but for things I might need to permanently put in my notes later. Okay, so here is our fleshed out notes. Um, remember I said I was going to use color, and as you can see, there's a lot of little pink boxes and arrows, underlines, and stars. Um, I use pink to highlight the important information my instructor mentioned in class. Um, now, if color coding distracts you, you don't have to do this step. You can still have all this important information and can still flesh out your notes using the same color throughout. Um, you will see that all those spaces that we left earlier now kind of all contain some extra information. Like I said, she, I figured she was going to give us more in class, and she definitely did. Uh, estimating how much extra space is not exact, so don't be afraid to draw an arrow over and add more information over there. You know, it's we're not trying to make this look like a beauty queen in a perfect professional document. We're just trying to make sure we have all the information down and that it's fairly organized so that we understand what is going on. Now, just because class is over, you know, we're not done with fleshing out our notes. Um, we still need to work on our notes after class. Um, if you chose not to flesh out your notes during class, then this is when you're going to need to do that. And uh, preferably you are going to complete this portion of the process within a few hours after class. You know, I know that's not always feasible, but you need to try to get it done as soon after class as you possibly can. You know, every hour after class that you're not reviewing this information, you start to lose it. So as soon as possible, we are going to continue fleshing out our notes. Um, we're going to go back and look at any of those post-its we might have listed, referring us to other areas we need to go to. We may listen to the recordings of the lecture if that's available to you. Um, you might want to invest in a video recorder, a video recorder, an audio recorder, um, and ask permission to use it. Um, in your lecture if your school does not offer recording services. Um, this helps ensure that you caught all the information that you're possibly going to need. Plus, just rehearing the lecture will help you to retain that information, kind of keep it fresh in your mind. We are also going to want to read over our notes and ensure that our writing is legible and that what you wrote makes sense. If you wait several days to review and you come across a word that you cannot read or a sentence that you're like, I have no idea what I just wrote, you might not be able to decipher it. You might not be able to recall what it was you were originally thinking. Um, so do it as soon as possible. That way you can recall the information quicker if you come across anything that is not legible to you. Um, and add in any of mnemonics of your own. I mean, if you don't use mnemonics, I highly recommend them for nursing school. It's a great way to uh, spark your brain to remember a whole lot of information. Um, and if you try to make up your own, again, it's another way that you're engaging your brain and trying to get it to think these things out on its own instead of just remembering something somebody else said. Um, and those might come to you in the middle of class. You might have remembered some really awesome story that can help you re recall this information. And you just didn't have time to do it, you know, write it down in class. So get that on paper as soon as possible. And I like to put those on little post-its as well. Okay, so we are done with the notes. So we can take a deep breath. We can do a little happy dance. But we can't get lazy because... Yes, the note-taking portion might have taken several days and took a lot of our time. Um, we're about to get to the critical thinking column. Um, and this is the part where we really have to expand our thinking, engage our brain, and this is where we're setting down our study routes. So within 24 to 48, after, 48 hours after class, I mean, preferably as soon as you've had a chance to kind of read over your notes a couple of times, we're going to start working on our critical thinking column. Now, there's a little warning here. I don't want you to get discouraged, but this is probably the hardest part of the Cornell note system. 
we are going to use our notes to create critical thinking questions. And to create a critical thinking question, we have to think critically. And this is not something that we all naturally have. It takes some time to master. It takes some practice. So please, 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 please don't get discouraged at this stage. Um, we need these critical thinking questions because, you know, nursing is not black or white. It is based on our ability to take knowledge and facts and kind of apply them to 30 different scenarios because um, everybody's different there's no two humans alike and we've got to be able to you know think outside the box on a lot of things um, do we have facts that we have to memorize absolutely we have a lot of facts that we have to memorize but that's not going to get the job done that's not going to get us to be a great nurse that's not going to get us to pass our boards We've got to memorize the facts and be able to apply those. So this is where the big drastic change is between basic Cornell notes and nursing Cornell notes that I have found. So here are some tips on how to do these critical thinking questions. Um, we are wanting to ask why and how questions. We want to try and avoid questions that begin with what. What questions tend to be fact-based questions. You know, they just require you to recall a small amount of information or just like a specific value. Um, not to say that you're not going to need those. There are definitely facts that we have to memorize. You know, the therapeutic range for digoxin or normal sodium levels. I mean, those. It's perfectly acceptable to in your critical thinking column have a question you know what is the therapeutic range for digoxin because you've got to get that in your head um, but we want to try to avoid those you know questions like what is an ACE inhibitor you know that doesn't require me to think about ACE inhibitors it just requires me to tell you what it is um, you want to try to expand beyond what is written in your notes um, you want to Think of the concept that was given to you in lecture and kind of play the what if game. You know, what if this would happen or what if that would happen? You know, you're kind of wanting just to think beyond. Pull in concepts that you have learned from other uh, nursing classes. You know, we're in pharmacology, but pull in some, you know, patient safety information in there. Or pull in some, um, you know, elimination information in there you kind of you know, pull in everything that you've learned as much as you can and you know try to create you know a basic client scenario it doesn't have to be full-blown NCLEX style but think of a kind of a client scenario basic simple NCLEX question that might could possibly be asked you know you that engages your brain to think about the concept and think about how it could be used for testing purposes. You know, it gets you to think about the entire concept from multiple different areas. Um, and again, this engages your brain. This is your act of learning. This is where, you know, you start expanding your, your bubble into including other bubbles and gets you to think like a nurse. So. Here's our page with the critical thinking column filled out. And again, you'll notice I use color. You don't have to. I like to color code those. I want them to stand out. Um, but you will see I have a lot of questions there. So you know, don't think that, oh my god, I have to have 10 critical thinking questions for a subtopic. No, 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 no. You might only have two. You might have 10. You might have 20. Um, it all depends on the topic. And again, this takes some time to develop the skill. So if you can only come up with one, maybe two critical thinking questions, that's a great, that's wonderful. We'll roll with that. Make the rest of your questions be fact-based. You know, fact-based questions are better than no questions. But just push every time to try to expand, you know, your ability to create critical thinking questions. You know, just keep training your brain to think that way. Um, so notice the last kind of two questions here are kind of my scenario based questions. You know, they're pretty simple. I don't think they would be on any exam that we would have, but it gives me to start thinking about how to take an NCLEX style question. Um, and I had to force myself to think like an instructor 
who would be creating test questions, you know, and that kind of gets your brain really involved in this active learning process. So again, take another deep breath because we are now on the downhill stretch. Um, the critical thinking column is the hardest part. The note taking section is the longest part. Um, from here on out, we're just going to be reviewing everything. You know, that's all we're going to be doing, just reviewing. So over the next few days, so again, we've had we've spent a day or two possibly creating our notes before class we've had our class we've spent a day maybe a day and a half reviewing the notes writing our critical thinking question and for you know like the next two or three days all we're going to do is read over those notes um we're just going to review the notes several times listen to me several times not just once and we're going to use our questions. We are going to first maybe just start asking those questions, you know, ask the question, look over to where we have our notes and answer the question. And then, you know, as we progress, we're going to maybe fold the paper over to where our note column is covered, you know, put a book over it, do whatever you got to do to cover it up, and then ask those same questions and try to answer them without looking at our notes. And I recommend asking and answering your questions out loud. Uh, you might look a little crazy. Your family members might think you're a little, you've lost your mind. But hearing the question out loud and hearing yourself talk, it's just another way to help you retain and comprehend the material. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with this next point, which is, you know, teach the material. When I'm driving to school, I'm trying to explain a concept to this imaginary person sitting beside me. Um, people passing me while I'm driving probably really think I'm insane because I'm acting like I'm a teacher to some imaginary being and I'm explaining, you know, ACE inhibitors to them. Um, I'm even maybe acting like it's a patient and I'm giving him patient education. Because um, when you get to the point that you can have a conversation about a topic, um, explain it to another person or an imaginary person, you've got a firm grasp on that concept by that point. I mean, there's, you've got it. You, you're you good. Um, if you don't want to talk to an imaginary person, grab your pet or your kid or your spouse and force them to learn the information with you. Uh, just get, try to get to a point where you can talk about it. Not knowledge-based student learning I'm regurgitating facts talk about it I mean really talk about it um, this gives you kind of the opportunity that number one new critical thinking questions may come to mind and you're like oh I need to write those on my notes and do write those on your notes but it also might be to a point when you're trying to explain something and you get confused or you get to a certain point and you don't remember well, now you've just flagged an area that you know you need to go back and study on, that you need to go back and review. Um, and you might not get that just trying to keep it all into your head. If you hear it out loud, you can really pinpoint those areas that you might not be so clear on. So after a few days of review, so again, we've spent a day or two making notes. We've had our lecture. We've spent a day or two writing our critical thinking questions. We've spent a day, maybe two, reviewing that information. Um, we're ready to write a summary. Uh, you know, and that review period is different from person to person. There are some lectures where I've had to spend five days reviewing. And there are some lectures where I had to spend one day reviewing. So, you know, don't get too harped up on the time limits that I'm giving here. They're just kind of examples. But it's in this summary that you're going to see why it was so important to keep it as one subtopic per page. Because we are going to compose um, a five to seven sentence summary of the content only on that page. You know, this is on that bottom section of our notes. So our subtopic for this page is temperature. My summary is only about temperature. If I had temperature and pain on the same page, it would be pretty hard for me to summarize both of those subtopics in five to seven sentences with enough detail to get my brain to really think about the material. 
up. We're not going to go into long details. We're going to keep it brief. But we're going to make sure we have enough detail to spark our brain, to think about all the large amount of details we need to know about this. Um, we're going to try to steer clear from listing, you know, the 10 signs and symptoms of this disease process. You know, we don't, we don't need to list all those. We need to maybe list a few important ones, um, but it's more important to keep the summary to where you are thinking about the concept. Um, and not just regurgitating and reading the concept that's, you know, reading the whole concept. But once you get it down, you need to review the summary, like, at least once a day, up until the day of the test. Um, this keeps this information fresh in your brain. Like I said, every hour you go without reviewing something, you kind of start to lose a little bit of it. So, reading it multiple times a day, or like I said, at least once a day, Keeps it in your head, keeps it fresh. Um, you'll, you know, keeps it to where, oh, you read the sentence, you know, and it's like, oh, it's, you know, a drug that lowers BP and they're at risk for orthostatic hypotension. And that's my sentence. And now my brain is thinking fall risk and remove bath towels from the, the floor and sit up slowly and give the med at night and, you know, all these different things that orthostatic hypotension is now made my brain start thinking about you know I don't have them listed in my summary but they're there and constantly reviewing reviewing and reviewing this information keeps those little sparks of knowledge energy coming to my brain also reviewing it once a day you know this can alleviate the need to cram before the test um, and cramming for a test gets you nowhere. I mean, you might still do fine on that test, but you haven't retained the information. You haven't really learned the concept. You've just recognized words on a page and go, hey, that must be the answer. Um, and cramming leads to a lot of stress. You know, we have test anxiety as it is. Knowing that you crammed for the test just elevates that anxiety so much more than it needs to be. And that can cause you to do worse on a test than you did even if you didn't study. And reviewing every day, reviewing the summary, uh, gives you the opportunity that if, you know, you review, you read your summary and you're like, you know, nothing is coming, you know, I'm not getting any sparks from this, or did I mean that it, you know, does potassium wasting, you know, like put me at risk for something? I'm not quite sure. You know, I've just now pinpointed that I might not have the knowledge on this material solidified in my brain as much as I would need it to. So that's fine. Just go back up, look back up the page, reread the notes, re ask yourself those critical thinking questions. Um, you know, if you read the summary and you got it and your brain started thinking about 90 million other things that relates to this topic, you've got it. Flip the page over and go to the next one. There's, you know, you will you can sit there and go, okay, hey, content on page three, five, seven. I got it. I don't need to look at that anymore. But the stuff on page one and two and four, I need to review a little bit more on. So it kind of lets you know where you stand on each subtopic and know which subtopics you need to focus more of your energy on. And also, if you're, you know, it gives you time to say, hey, I don't understand this. Let me go and talk to my instructor or let me go get a tutor and see if I can get some help. So review your summary every, every, every day until the day of the test. And here's our final notes. This is what they're going to look like when they're done. Um, again, you see a color code. Don't worry about the coloring. You don't have to do it. Try to get your notes looking like this within three to five days after class. Um, if you can do that, then that should give you plenty of time to review and study that material until the test. Um, we, you know, this is a tool. This is the whole system. You know, we have spent a lot of time. Um, making the notes, fleshing out the notes, 
creating questions and having the summary, you know, that's the Cornell note taking system. Now we have a really wonderful tool that helps us study for the test. Um, and then think about when you get to your comprehensive final. Now all you have is just, you know, read your summary and only focus on those areas to where you're like, oh, I need to think about more on this or, oh, I need to really review this one. You know, this can help streamline your comprehensive final study. Now, before I let you go, just, you know, some quick final tips about the Cornell Note system. Um, I know this video is pretty long and I'm very sorry. Um, but you want to adapt the system to your style. You know, you can type your notes, write your notes. You can use color coding. You don't have to use color coding. Uh, you don't want to get behind. Um, the system does require you to put in a lot of effort. Uh, so don't get behind. Um, have your base notes completed before class. I know that's not always achievable, but really try. Uh, use the class time just to add in extra information. Do not, I do not recommend trying to create your notes from scratch in class. Uh, you risk missing more information than you get written down. Um, review and write your questions and do your summary. Like I said, try to have everything done three to five days after class. And that gives you plenty of time to expose yourself to the content and find your weak areas. Um, and review that summary every day before the test. That really gives you plenty, like I say, plenty of time to figure out where you're, uh, where you need to spend more time, uh, where you need to spend, where you need to get more help on. So, I hope this video has inspired you to try the system. Um, I know this is a long video, and I'm very sorry, and I know that there's a lot of information in it, but Please feel free to ask any questions in the comment section below, and I will try to respond to each as quickly as I possibly can. Um, I look forward to hearing from you and sharing more tips and tricks and videos on how to study and get through nursing school. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.